In the last episode, we began to unpack the facts surrounding the infamous backyard photos of Lee Harvey Oswald. These pictures show Oswald holding a rifle in one hand and two supposedly communist newspapers in the other. He's also got a revolver holstered on his waist. In the absence of any other information, these pictures say a lot. If they're authentic, then they show that Oswald had both the rifle and the revolver in late March of 1963. The newspapers appear to support the idea that he was a radical communist, which some Warren Report defenders say was Oswald's motive in killing the president. In this episode, we look at arguments advanced by Warren Report critics about the authenticity of these backyard photos. Should we take these pictures at face value, or is there something more going on? In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The first reports say that President Kennedy has been seriously wounded by this shooting. The flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. This is Solving JFK. I'm your host, Matt Crumpton. After Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested, he was interviewed by Captain Fritz at the Dallas jail. Fritz showed Oswald one of the versions of the backyard photo. According to Captain Fritz's declassified notes, he wrote, quote, Showed photo of gun. Would not discuss. Oswald says I made picture superimposed. And Oswald also told Fritz, quote, I understand photography very well, and I will prove this is a fake. It's true that Oswald worked at Jagger's Child Stovall, and he had knowledge of photography. So Oswald, more so than the average person, would be aware of photographic forgery techniques. But then again, if you believe that Oswald is guilty, then we can't take Oswald's analysis seriously since most guilty people will say anything it takes to keep their freedom. While Oswald says the picture of him holding two guns in the backyard was faked, the HSCA photo experts concluded that the image was authentic. There were several reasons why the HSCA reached this conclusion. The scratches around the edge of the image, the imperfect edges, and the blur away from the center of the image. All of those things were consistent with the photo coming from the Imperial Reflex camera. And the HSCA photo panel did test CE750, the specific Imperial Reflex camera that was ultimately determined to belong to Oswald. Aside from Oswald's claim that the photos are faked, are there any other reasons to believe that his claim may be true? If you ask Warren Report critics, there are at least nine independent reasons to doubt the authenticity of the backyard photos. First, the man pictured is wearing black pants and a black polo style shirt. After thorough searches, neither of those articles of clothing were found among Oswald's belongings. If the shirt and pants were found, it would be a strong argument in support of the photo being authentic. But they weren't found. Sure, Oswald could have thrown these clothes away, but only about seven and a half months passed in between the date when the photos were allegedly taken and in between when Oswald's belongings were searched. If you think that Oswald really did take these pictures, it doesn't make sense that he would have thrown the clothes away to destroy the evidence because, remember, he took the incriminating photos in the first place under that scenario. 
And that's the act of a zealot, not someone who's worried about avoiding jail time. Second, there's an inconsistency with the rifle sling in the backyard photos as compared to the rifle sling that was found in the school book depository. The leather sling attached to the rifle found in the depository was not the same as the sling in the backyard photos, according to the FBI's own expert, Lindahl Shaneyfelt, who told the Warren Commission, quote, I find it to be different from the sling that is presently on the rifle. It has the appearance of being a piece of rope that is tied at both ends rather than being a leather sling. So that means Oswald would have had to get a new leather rifle sling. And no, it would not have been difficult for him to do that. He could have gone to any gun shop in Dallas and bought a leather rifle sling. Just like he could have gone to any gun shop in Dallas and bought a gun instead of the whole mail order charade that he allegedly ended up doing. Either way, the necessity of Oswald acquiring a different rifle sling is one more thing to consider. Third, many critics say that something doesn't look right with Oswald's chin in the photos. The focus of these claims is typically that the shadow under the chin goes straight down, whereas the shadow of Oswald's body goes to the right. The FBI attempted to recreate the photo with the same lighting at the same time of day, and they did, but they then removed the face of the man from the photo so that you couldn't see where the shadow on the nose went, which made the entire exercise done by the FBI sort of pointless. The implication by critics is that Oswald's face was added into another photo and that the shadows don't match. Another discrepancy that's emphasized by skeptics is the shape of the jawbone and chin structure of the person in the photo as compared to other known pictures of Oswald. Recently, there have been researchers like Professor Henry Farid who claim to have recreated the image with shadows that are consistent with the backyard photos. Farid performed detailed tests to confirm how the shadows would fall on human faces using 3D models. In doing that experiment, Farid confirmed that the shadows in the photo are consistent with how they would have been if taken at the same time of day in that same location. In other words, Farid believes that the backyard photos are authentic. On the other hand, there's language in the HSCA report that leaves the door open that the image could have been a photographic composite. The HSCA microscopically examined the area above and below the horizontal chin cleft. They were looking to see whether the grains of silver in the photo were consistently distributed. When they did this, they found that there was no difference in the grain structure. But the HSCA report then has this disclaimer, quote, Under very carefully adjusted display conditions, the scanned image of the Oswald backyard negative did exhibit irregular, very fine lines in the chin area. The lines appeared, however, only with the aerospace gradient enhancement process where the technique was applied at a much higher resolution. The report then goes on to explain that the lines don't necessarily prove forgery because, quote, similar lines, although less pronounced, were found on a known authentic photograph. Critics of the official story have pointed out that the grain pattern would be consistent and the scratches would also be present if an imperial reflex camera was used to take a picture of an existing photo which had been doctored. This is because the photographic experts examined only one negative in the 133A DeMorne Schilt photo. And their findings of authenticity were simply that, one, the photo came from Oswald's imperial reflex camera, and two, because the grains on the photos were consistent throughout, it was unlikely that there was an image superimposed on the images they examined. 
But a person skilled in photographic forgery could simply take a photo of another forged photograph with an imperial reflex camera, and the end result would have consistent scratch marks from an imperial reflex and a consistent grain pattern from the same photo. In other words, the metadata on the photo would be consistent with an authentic image, but the substance of the photo itself would not be original, but would be a picture of a picture. The HSCA findings do not rule out that scenario. The fourth potential reason to view the backyard photos with skepticism is the ghost photograph that was found in the Dallas Police Department in 1993. That year, the city manager's office decided to have all of the files cataloged and made available to the public. When reporters Ray and Mary LaFontaine searched these newly released documents, they found a strange picture. It was a pose of the infamous backyard photos of Oswald with the same background, but the figure of the man was cut out, leaving a white space in the shape of a man's silhouette. This image became known as the ghost photograph. In addition to the ghost photograph, the reporters also found a photo of Officer Bobby Brown in a pose very similar to Oswald in the same backyard on Neely Street. According to Brown, he took that picture at the request of the Secret Service a few days after the assassination. Brown told author Gary Savage that he then had his image removed from the photo because he didn't want to be identified with it. He said that he cut his image out of a developed photo and placed a white sheet of paper behind it. In other words, Brown claimed that the ghost photo that was in the Dallas PD archives was a picture of Officer Brown, not a photo of Oswald. But anyone who looks carefully at these images can immediately tell that the cutout does not match the outline of Officer Brown's body. However, the outline is an exact match for Oswald's body in the image labeled 133C, which is the one pose that the Warren Commission didn't have access to. So it turns out that it wasn't Officer Brown who was cut out of the photo. It was Oswald. When confronted with this information, Officer Brown changed his story and said that he actually cut the picture out because the FBI wanted to get Oswald's image on a white background. But for what purpose? Brown specifically said that it was him in the photo and that he cut his image out because he didn't want to be associated with it. But then he changed his story to something else when challenged with the reality that the photo was really of Oswald. The fact that there's no police report explaining why these photos exist is concerning, especially after the key witness to the ghost photograph, Officer Brown, was caught in a lie that continues to be unexplained to this day. Reason number five to doubt the backyard photos is the two competing stories of exactly how they were found. The FBI wanted to know more about the details of how these backyard photos were found. So they asked Detective John Adamsik and Detective Guy Rose, two of the four Dallas cops who said they didn't see the Imperial Reflex camera, exactly how they found the pictures. Both of them said, quote, from a packet of 47 photographs found in the search. Adamsik told the FBI that he numbered each photo and placed his initials on them. And when we look at the back of these pictures that are relied on by the Warren Commission, they are indeed numbered, and Adamsik's initials appear on the back. So it looks like these backyard photos were found in a packet of 47 other pictures, just like Adamsik and Rose say. Everything seems to be consistent with that story. But Detective Rose told a different story later when he spoke to the Warren Commission. In that testimony, Rose erases Adamsik from the story and says that it was just Detective Rose and Detective McCabe who found the photos. 
Given that Adam Six initials and numbering are on each of the photos, he's telling the truth here and Rose is either mistaken or lying. I don't know which and I don't know why. The sixth reason to doubt the backyard photos is that the two supposedly communist newspapers that Oswald was holding in his hands are actually contradictory to one another. The militant was published by Trotskyites, people who were in favor of an international communist revolution. They didn't just want revolution in their own backyard, they wanted it to be worldwide. Whereas the other paper Oswald had, The Worker, was aligned with the Soviet Union. The ideology that was espoused in these two publications differed wildly. For anyone who was steeped in 1963 left-wing politics, it would look silly for Oswald to be holding up both the militant and the worker at the same time. Nevertheless, that's what these photos show. Reason number seven. There's the more out on a limb argument that the photo itself is authentic, but it was taken of another person who is not actually Lee Harvey Oswald. The analysis here is really focused on the face of the person in the backyard photos as compared to known pictures of Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, everyone assumes that these are the same people because the photo looks very much like Oswald. And Oswald's wife, Marina, is on the record saying that she took the photo. I spent a while comparing the backyard photo face with other pictures of Oswald. The one thing that jumps out at me is that Oswald's chin seems to be more pointy, whereas the chin in the backyard photo is more squared. But then again, if we're to believe Captain Fritz's notes, even Oswald himself admitted that it was his face in the picture, although he said that someone superimposed his face. The eighth reason to pause before adopting the idea that the backyard photos are authentic is that there are three people who claim to have been shown one of these photos at the Dallas police station before they were discovered in Ruth Payne's garage on Saturday afternoon the day after the assassination. Washington Evening Star reporter Jerry O'Leary confirmed to the FBI that he was shown one of these backyard photos at the Dallas police station either on the evening of the assassination or early the next morning. Michael Payne told the Warren Commission that on the night of the assassination, the police asked him where Oswald was standing when he was holding the rifle that was later on the cover of Life magazine. Payne said that he thought the picture was taken at Oswald's Neely Street house. He said that he could tell it was that house from the clapboard sighting on the house in the picture. But according to Michael Payne's Warren Commission testimony, he went to this Neely Street duplex where the photo was taken only one time when he was picking up the Oswalds for dinner. As far as we know, he never went around to the backyard when he was there. So it's a little surprising that he was able to immediately identify the backyard where these photos were taken. And according to Payne, that identification was on the night of the assassination before the backyard photos were found. Payne's testimony about being shown the photo on Friday night is supported by the notes of Captain Will Fritz. In those notes, Fritz describes asking Oswald on Saturday late morning and early afternoon about where he was living when the picture was made. Fritz said that Oswald was evasive about the location, but he also said, quote, Mr. Payne told me about where Oswald lived on Neely Street. At first, I didn't think this was a big deal because we don't know the exact moment when the photos were discovered on Saturday afternoon. It's possible that they were discovered in time to bring them to the station so that they could be in Fritz's notes. But what Fritz actually says is that Michael Payne identified the house. 
And we know that Payne was at the police station on Friday night, not Saturday morning or afternoon. Together, the testimony of Jerry O'Leary, Michael Payne, and Captain Fritz shows that at least one of the backyard photos was at the police department before it was officially found. And I can't make that make sense. Finally, the ninth reason to have concerns about the backyard photo is the story of Roscoe White and the photograph known as 133CDs. Roscoe White began working for the Dallas police on October 7th, 1963, about six weeks before the assassination. White worked in the photographic department of the Dallas police. According to his widow, Geneva Dees, he was skilled in trick photography. She said that the photo that she turned over to the HSCA was obtained by Roscoe White during the course of his employment with the Dallas police. What makes the Roscoe White angle intriguing for a lot of people is that White served in the Marines in Atsugi, Japan at the same time as Oswald. Given that enlisted men would go to the same clubs, it's very possible, but not confirmed, that Roscoe White may have known Oswald in the Marines. Oh, and get this, White's wife, Geneva, worked at Jack Ruby's Carousel Club. Believe it or not, those facts are not disputed. But what is more contested is whether Roscoe White was one of the assassins of President Kennedy, which is what his widow and his son both believe. There's one more point that's relevant to Roscoe White as it pertains to these backyard photos. When he was in the military, White broke his right wrist, which resulted in a protrusion a couple of inches behind the wrist. Some researchers believe that this same protrusion appears on the arm of the man in the backyard photos. Personally, I can't tell. The picture just isn't clear enough for me to make it out one way or the other. Whether Roscoe White's body is pictured in the backyard photo or not, you have to admit that it's a little strange that the HSCA photo experts ended up reviewing a picture from a guy who served with Oswald in Atsugi, was an expert in trick photography, and told his family that he was personally involved in the Kennedy assassination. Then again, maybe Roscoe White just made a copy of the photo for himself because he knew it would have historical value, and the Marine link to Oswald and Geneva's employment at the Carousel Club with Jack Ruby could just be coincidences. One final point. If it really is Oswald in the photo, it's possible that he was told to take this picture as part of his work setting up a legend of a serious communist who was potentially violent. I'm not saying that's what happened, just that it is a possibility to consider. In other words, even if the photo is completely legit, that doesn't necessarily mean that the story behind it is. Even after all of the information we've covered over the last few episodes, I still don't know for sure whether the backyard photos are real or fake. But here's what I do know. The negative that was tested was authentic, and it was taken by Commission Exhibit 750, the Imperial Reflex camera that's in evidence. But a photographic forgery is still possible. We can't rule out that someone took a picture of a composite picture using this Imperial Reflex camera. The circumstances surrounding the discovery of the Imperial Reflex and the substitution of that camera into the record in exchange for the Stereo Realist camera is suspicious. The timing of Marina staying at Robert Oswald's house in between changing her story about the cameras seems to suggest the possibility that they may have spoken about it. But why would Robert Oswald want to incriminate his own brother? If he's not telling the truth, then 
What's he doing? If he is telling the truth, then why did he hold on to the camera for so long without telling the FBI? There's not really hard proof here, just a lot of unanswered questions. The fact that three people saw the backyard photo before it was officially discovered at the Dallas Police Department combined with the ghost photograph cut out of Oswald from 133C and Officer Brown's changing stories on why he cut the figure out tends to show that there could have been forgery or some other shenanigans going on. I just don't know what it is exactly. Finally, the argument that cuts the strongest against Oswald to me is the handwriting match on the back of the DeMorenschilt photo. If the HSCA handwriting expert is correct, and Oswald really did write the inscription to my friend George, then that seems to prove that it must be Oswald in the photo if he has his handwriting on the back. But the additional handwriting from two other unknown people who are not Marina and not George DeMorenschilt makes that evidence even more confusing. My ultimate answer on the backyard photos is that while the single photo and the single negative tested by the HSCA were not doctored, we can't rule out that someone took a picture of a picture. The foreknowledge of the photos before they were officially discovered is my biggest problem with taking these photos seriously. Because of that, and all the other reasons that we mentioned in the last two episodes, whether Oswald's face was superimposed or not, the backyard photos should be viewed with healthy skepticism and an open mind. Next time on Solving JFK, we turn our attention to the shooting of General Edwin Walker. Did Lee Harvey Oswald shoot at General Walker? And why is it so important to find out? If you heard anything that you believe is out of context, or if you have additional information to offer, you can let us know at solvingjfkpodcast at gmail.com. Please provide citations to the record for any fact that you're relying on. For transcripts, sources, and official podcast merchandise, Visit SolvingJFKPodcast.com. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Thanks for listening. Visit SolvingJFKPodcast.com for more information. <laughs>